All right, dear people, let's go ahead and, uh, there we go, um, please get your, get a handout for lesson two of Daniel um, as we begin to get into the text of the book. Um, you know, this is, this is, a, this is an exciting book. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> as I talked with people about, you know, what we're going to do in Sunday school, and often you mention we're going to do Daniel, and there's just, oh, that's exciting. I want to hear Daniel. Why? Why? Because Daniel talks about what we all need to hear, and that's what, how God is moving and working and doing to accomplish His glorious purpose, ultimately to enthrone His Son, to, to bring glory to Jesus Christ, and, and uh, you know, I was thinking about this, Daniel, in his context, what a wonderful man. We're going to enjoy learning about his heart and what sustained him in the midst of this lifelong uh, service to a pagan empire. And, uh, and, and yet, what sustained him sustains us, and we're... <laughs> we, we're 2,500 years down the road from when Daniel gave us these magnificent prophecies of God's plan and purpose for humanity. And so we have the ability to think through this book and, and appreciate a God who is so sovereign over centuries, centuries, centuries of hum, human history working with omnipotent power to bring about his will. And we're in the midst of it. We're getting to the end of it. And so as we discuss these things, I just, I pray that it'll be a great encouragement to you because Daniel's heart needs to be our heart in terms of what sustained him in the midst of a dark, fallen land. So, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive in there together and enjoy, enjoy our time in Daniel. <clears throat> Father, we, we must just humbly bow before you. You are beyond our ability to comprehend your being, your person, your triunity, and you are working every day to bring about your purposes in every place, in every person's life. We know that in Hebrews we're told that it is through the Lord Jesus that this occurs. He upholds all things by the word of his power. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And so, as he upholds all things and moves every moment forward in history under your sovereign hand, Father, to bring glory to your name, we, we are part of that. This day today is part of that. So help us to understand not only the big picture of who you are and what you are doing and why you are doing it, but also how our little lives are part of it. You have designed our lives to do exactly what you're doing, and that's to set Christ on display with our lives and our lips through the gospel, not only proclaimed but lived. So we just pray that you would help us to appreciate this wonderful book written so long ago that has to do with the big picture of who you are and what you're doing. Thank you for Daniel and his life. What a wonderful example of a saint saved alone by your mercy and grace and changed in the same way. So we give ourselves to you now, Lord. We pray for those who are sick. Um, I just think of our dear sister Jana Pine in the hospital with COVID and lung problems and 
just give her to you and all many others who have had to go through this. We commit to you all of our ills and uh, problems, especially we pray that you'd use your word in our lives today to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ as we live for you. So we commit this to you now for the glory of Jesus unto the glory of your great name, Father, promoted in the power of the Spirit. To that end, we pray. Amen. Okay. Let's see. Start with blowing my nose. All right. Daniel, listen to. As we saw last lesson... Daniel is a big picture book. <laughs> Why? Because it's about God. It's about Israel's God, the only true God, and his faithfulness to his covenant promises. Boy, we have to see that. He's a faithful, covenant keeping God. From verse 1, God is present, as we will see, as the supreme sovereign over Israel and the Gentile nations, doing his will. <clears throat> to accomplish his purposes. He's the author of Daniel and his friend's circumstances. Didn't happen by chance. He's the author of these things. And, and he's going to use them, the, the, the faithful Jewish remnant, these young men, to reveal, to reveal his person, power, and plans for the history of mankind in the midst of a pagan empire. And God is moving in mankind's history to do what? To fulfill his eternal purpose to set his anointed king, the Messiah, on Mount Zion, his holy mountain. Remember Psalm 2. It starts with, it's the Davidic kingship that, are, that they're sons of God, but there's one son that it's really pointing to. And God says, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, Mount Zion, the holy mount, throne of God, my holy mountain. That's where God is moving. Why? Because it's in fulfillment of his covenant with David, promising in 2 Samuel 7, 16, David, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever where God is going. And we read in Daniel 7, 14, this coming glorious kingdom of the Son of Man is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. See, these verses all dovetail together from beginning to end in the Scriptures. Last week, we did kind of a little review. Right from the beginning, when Adam sinned and he lost the relationship with God and he lost rule the way it was supposed to be exercised over the world under God. God's been moving to recover what he lost through one person, to set one person on display, and that's the Lord Jesus. He's the one as the God-man who's going to recover that rule the way it was meant to be, and under him we as kingdom citizens will fulfill what God had purposed for us as human beings, ruling over the earth under Jesus. And so these texts string together from Genesis, you remember Genesis 49 right off the bat, uh, where Jacob's blessing his sons, and, and, and he, he promises that there's going to be a king coming from the tribe of Judah, the one who's going to be the lion from the tribe of Judah. Like a lion he lies down, like a lion he rises up. The scepter, the king's scepter shall not depart from Judah, right at the beginning. Verses about the king in Deuteronomy. These verses that we have in 2 Samuel then about the promise, and then now in Daniel, and, and, and we can move on right to the New Testament in Luke where the Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Behold, you're going to conceive in your womb. Here he is, bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That's the, that's the Davidic covenant. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, Israel, forever, as well as all the other nations, and his kingdom, because it's a kingdom, it's an empire, will have no end. Doesn't that, don't those all work together? 
He's come. He's coming again. And that's where Daniel takes us. In Daniel chapter 7, the glorious appearing of this king coming to fulfill God's promises and word. It's a big picture book, people. And what Daniel has predicted, we are hoping for to happen soon. I pray that's your hope. So let's, in the first seven verses, we're going to try to get through the first seven verses uh, today, together. Daniel, the historical context is set for us. We're going to talk about that. I don't know about you, but I love history. History is exciting because God is moving in every mo- nation and individual's life to do his will. It's great to see how he does that, even when nations don't even understand it or know what he's doing. He's doing his will. So we have a historical context set. God ensures that Daniel and his three friends are accepted into the training program to become servants to the king in his court of official advisors. That didn't happen by accident. We'll see that. God's ruling. So, Daniel 1, 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Wow. Now, Tanner, the the man I primarily have been using uh, for Daniel in commentary, says these kinds of things just to give us, set the stage. I like some of the things he says, so doesn't bother me to share them with you. Jehoiakim came to the throne of Judah in October of 609 B.C. That's a long time ago. (laughs) Following King Josiah, a righteous king, King Josiah's death at the hands of the Egyptian pharaoh, Necho II. And a lot of these things, remember the handout I gave you last time has a lot of the history that unfolded. You can go back and read that if you like history. You can see how this unfolds with these great empires of Babylon and Egypt and Assyria all having things happen and God doing his will. In the, it was important for, you know, God took Josiah's death, took Josiah's life at the exact moment it needed to happen for his will to unfold for Judah, kingdom of Judah. In the following years, Judah remained a vassal state of Egypt. It's the way it always worked, with the burden of annual tribute. When the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians at Carchemish in 605, they pursued them southward, thus driving them back to Egypt. This naturally brought the Babylonians to Judah, where they quickly advanced on the capital at Jerusalem and laid siege to it. Okay, and in the summer of 605, but before Nebopolassar's death on 15, 16 August. And pro- you know, this, it, it, you remember that I gave you that little map last time? Uh, we have another map we'll look at later, but this little map of the you know, in your last handout, you can, you can just see God designed Israel to be in the middle of the great nations of the time. And as they did battle and conflict and had issues, they're smack in the middle of it. Why did God do that? For his glory, his honor. And so, Every time there's great movements of nations, they're picking a side or they're getting involved. And this time, as Babylon suppresses Egypt and goes through the Holy Land, you know, they are dealing with Israel. They have they lay siege. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But Daniel was probably only a young teenage boy. 
growing up in Judah when his country was suddenly besieged by Babylon in 605. It would be, and God takes, takes us through these things in time. Things happen over time, but they happen. And things like this huge empire of Babylon, which was predicted would be dealing with them, starts to happen. Besieged, 605. Daniel, when this happens, Daniel and many other choice young men of Judah were forcibly taken into exile to Babylon at that time. There, summary now, Daniel would spend the rest of his life. In the course of time, of course, you know the story, God promoted him. He rose to become a very prominent official in the courts of Babylon, serving under Nebuchadnezzar, powerful, mighty king. He would hear, this is interesting, after being there 19 years, he gets word in 586 about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He'd been there already 19 years. Gets the word about the destruction of the temple that he loved, the city that he loved, God's temple, God's city. He'd go on to live a long life, even living to see Babylon's overthrow at the hands of the Medes and the Persians in 539. And you know, one of the greatest chapters in the book is chapter 9 when he prays to God. We're going to, such a treat, we're going to enjoy his prayer together. Through all his days, however, Daniel remained faithful and true to the God of heaven. As a result, God used him in a mighty way, extraordinary ways, to interpret dreams, explain visions. And, and what we want to see as we move through is why why did he remain faithful? How did that happen just practically in this place? It's so important because you see, Daniel's heart is the heart of a believer. We want to understand that. The first two verses of Daniel introduce... I hope you can, see, you can see kind of what's going on. The, the contest and the conflict between the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and his gods, and the king of Israel, Jehoiakim, and his God, the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, and the personal God of Daniel and his companions. Throughout the book, we're going to see there's a conflict between two world views. On one side is the godless pagan perspective of the anti-God kingdom, kingdoms of history as they unfold, we'll see, exemplified now here by Babylon and culminating in Daniel in the final anti-God kingdom of the Antichrist. One worldview, one side. The other side is the kingdom of the true and the living creator God who rules over all and sets himself on display in the midst of this sovereignly ordained conflict. Isn't that amazing? Culminating in the establishment of his eternal kingdom under the Son of Man, the Messiah whose kingdom we will see will crush all other earthly kingdoms and endure forever. I mean, God could have done things a different way. And as Daniel move, as we move through the book of Daniel, you're gonna see, you're gonna see behind the scenes this conflict between God and his great enemy. Satan. Angels doing conflict behind nations doing conflict. We're going to see that. <clears throat> but you, you need to see also, I think an implication, folks, is that this God setting his name on display in the midst of conflict is true for you and me. 
what, what's going on in our lives every day? Who are you doing battle against? Who's your enemy? Remember Ephesians chapter 6? Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put the armor on. Do battle. Why the battle? For the glory of God. You're involved in a battle. Nations are involved in conflicts. And individuals who are believers are involved in this spiritual battle. Because God has chosen to set his name on display in the midst of a battle. So guess what? When you get to the end of, the, of Paul's life, I fought the good fight of faith. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Who's honored by that? Paul or his great saving, keeping God? When you make it to the end, and you will if you're his, through all the battles and the trials and the troubles with the perspective of, oh, Lord God, I even exalt in my tribulations because that's bringing honor and glory to you. I can't do it, but it's Christ who lives in me. Who is going to be exalted in that day when you stand perfect before the throne? God. It's not going to be you. But we're in the midst of it. We're fighting. You better be fighting. We're all in the midst of this. And when that darkness of the Antichrist kingdom is expelled by the beauty and the light and the glory of Christ returning, that conflict is going to do one thing, highlight him to the max as the enemies are defeated and he rules. So, we need to appreciate the conflict. And we're going to see more of that as we go through this morning, the difference in these two worldviews, for sure. In verse 1, Jerusalem is under siege. This is the siege of 605 B.C., beginning of the incursions by Nebuchadnezzar. That will include the de deportation of 597. You see, Daniel's carted off in 605. Ezekiel is brought to Babylon in 597. And the final deportation of Jews and the destruction of the city and the temple occurs in 586 B.C. under, again, Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Um, a big picture thought here. This is the beginning of the unfolding of centuries, people, still happening, of Gentile domination of Jerusalem. This is staggering to me. What is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is the city of the great king. God has chosen to set his name there, his throne there. Psalm 48, 1 and 2. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. And yet he's allowing it to be trampled underfoot. <laughs> Centuries. As we're going to see, various Gentile kingdoms under God's sovereign hand unfold, culminating in that final anti-God kingdom of the Antichrist. In Luke 21, 24, Jesus speaks about this time of Gentiles. Dominion, which includes the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in 70 AD by Titus and the Roman legions. He says, woe to those. This is what he says in Luke about that specific invasion. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. See, it's a judgment when God, it's a judgment. 
and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until, there's one of the great untils in the Bible. Come talk to me about that. I want a t-shirt with until. Ken likes others, I want until. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And man, then things are going to be unbelievably spectacular when he returns. And Daniel's going to reveal to us the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled when the Son of Man returns in power and glory and honor on the clouds of heaven to establish his kingdom on earth. That's when it's going to be done to never be replaced. Isn't that exciting? And we're 2,500 years closer to that happening than when Daniel prophesied. (laughs) And we have seen these kingdoms unfold in history. It's going to be exciting. In verse 2, we see who is in control of this conflict between kings and kingdoms and gods. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. The term used for God here is Adonai, Lord. And when used as a title of the one true God, the focus is on his sovereignty, majesty, and authority. And guess what the pagan kings end up acknowledging as he humbles them, those attributes of God. Who's in control? The sense of the verb gave is to surrender someone or something over to another, especially to an authority. So you're getting the picture here. I think it's hard to get our minds around the magnitude of this statement, people. The sovereign Lord the sovereign Lord today, <laughs> then and today, is moving nations around, as can be seen from the historical background up to this point in Israel's history, like pawns on a chessboard to accomplish his will. We forget who he is. <laughs> We forget so easily. Nebuchadnezzar, as he proclaims, after he was humbled by Daniel's God in Daniel 4.35, he says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. Nothing, people. The greatest nations, the greatest empires, it doesn't matter, they're nothing. Speck of dust on the scales. But he does according to his will. In the host of heaven, the holy and unholy angels, and among the inhabitants of the earth, from the greatest kings and kingdoms down to the pauper in the street, and no one can ward off his hand or say, what have you done? I'm holding you accountable. That's unbelievable. So when you look at our nation and our land, You need to remember this. I need to remember this. People in control, where all this injustice seems to be happening and everything, who's in control? This God is in control of this nation and all the other nations. Sorry. If you're a Christian, this is the God you know and serve, this God. The enemy's always whispering in your ear, trying to present him as less than something than he truly is. This is the God you know and serve. It's Daniel's God. It's our God. (laughs) This is amazing. Not only does he give Jehoiakim into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, but along with him, some of the vessels of the house of God. The text then states that Nebuchadnezzar, what? Brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Now, here's the question. What's the significance of Nebuchadnezzar doing that? 
in their day? What's the significance of him doing that with the vessels from the temple of Israel's God? What do you think? There you go. Say that again. Yeah. Yeah. In their day, if you win a victory, who's responsible? Your God. Do you remember when um, in Isaiah you have the Assyrians coming down to Jerusalem under Sennacherib? They come down against Judah and sea cities and they come up to Jerusalem and and he sends an envoy to King Hezekiah. And this is what the guy says. This is the perspective of these folks. This is his speech. Beware, people of Jerusalem, that Hezekiah does not mislead you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Severim? And when have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands has delivered their land from my hand that the Lord would deliver Jerusalem from my hand? You get the point? We're crushing you. Our God's greater than your God. Unbelievable. So let me ask you this then. Why is God allowing this to happen? Why would he do that? Why, why would God allow this? Why would God bring this about? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. With regard to Israel, why is this happening to them? Huh? But why is he doing it? Huh? They disobeyed. And what covenant does that bring into play? Well, after the Abrahamic covenant, that's a great answer. It is because of the Abrahamic covenant that they are his chosen nation. But in terms of hammering them for disobedience, what covenant's on the table right now? The Mosaic covenant, right? Remember, they, they're, they're constituted as a nation. All, they sprinkle blood. Moses sprinkles blood on them. You, you need to obey this covenant. It was a Susan vassal treaty. God's the king. They're his servants. He promises to protect, guide, lead, defend them, and they need to do what he tells them to do. Right? And if they don't do it, there's curses that come. So in a very real sense, God brings this about because he is faithful to his word and his promises, people. Even to the point of suffering personal defamation among the nations. We're going to see that's going to be corrected one day, though. But he's faithful to his word. Tanner comments again. He says, uh, vessels from Jerusalem in the temple, taken to Jerusalem and put in the temple of Marduk. It was symbolic, like you have just told me. The Babylonians attributed their success to their God. Page, Page four, we're going to have to keep moving. They didn't understand that Marduk wasn't even a god at all. You see, there's this conflict taking place. And then he answers the question the same way you guys did. Why would the Lord do this? Does he not love them? Was he not a God faithful to his covenant? And I would say amen to that. He's faithful to his word. So he promised them if they did not obey him, he would discipline them, maybe with their crops and their seasons and all that. But the the big hammer was, if you continue, you're going to get booted out of my land. And you're going to suffer in a land where you don't even know who they are, who the gods are, what's going on. Different language. Anyway, that's what's happening. Now, what you mentioned, sir, is critical. Why does God not ultimately throw them away when they disobey? Because of the Abrahamic covenant. That's an unconditional covenant God makes with Israel through Abraham. And he never throws them away even though they have 
under the Mosaic Covenant, disobedient generations. He won't go back on his word. We'll see that. Okay, implication. Here we go, implication. It's vital to understand, people, I think, that God is faithful to his word and promises for the sake of his name. He is truly a God to be loved, trusted, and obeyed, but he is also a God to be feared, people, in a right way. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 12? But I I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear him. The great condemnation of people outside of relationship with God, unregenerate people, Paul sums up in Romans 3.18. There's no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of God in this land, our land. There's no fear of God. Being accountable to him. Those who say, people in the church, those who say they love and trust God should also fear him. Why? He is serious about his promise to transform his children into the image of his son for the sake of his name. You can't be involved in the church and play games with God. Well, you can. But when it's all said and done, you may be shown to be a terror, never really having the relationship. That's scary. That's really scary. Because in the lives of his children, he is going to fulfill his promises. This means that he will deal with remaining sin in our lives as faithful parents deal with disobedience in the lives of their children. God's going to do this in the lives of his children. Man, we, we need to pray for this reverential awe and respect for the one who crushed his own son in order to bring us into a love relationship with himself. He crushed Jesus. And who will discipline us in order that we might share his holiness and enjoy the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You can read that in Hebrews chapter 12. See, to not, to not be disciplined by God because of our remaining sin implies you're an illegitimate child. You're not his, if he's not doing that. This fear of God, I think, and love for God are both new covenant heart motivations to obey God. I think we have the love part down, but dear people, fearing God in the right way is a motivation to obey him because he's serious about what he says, about what it means to know and love him. I think a flippant attitude towards sin in a professing Christian is a sign of not fearing or loving the one you say you do. And the continued practice of sin as a lifestyle reveals a heart that may still be dead to God even though there is a profession of faith. And you remember in Matthew chapter 7, many are going to stand before him and call him Lord and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you, even though they were involved in religious activity. No relationship. I think there's a tendency in the church today maybe to downplay God's holiness and focus on his love and acceptance, no matter how you live. That's a very dangerous path to be playing around with. How much sin can I do and still get into heaven? How much can I still of the world can I enjoy because I enjoy it so much and still be okay with God? That's not the way a Christian thinks. In Hebrews 12, 14, it says, Pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Right? You can't do it on your own, though. It's all done by the Spirit. Love relationship. Okay, some final thoughts. Page five. (laughs) I'll sum these up. I think this is important. Just some thoughts. God is a very patient God, people. Patient. Judah had been in the land over 800 years, most of which 
were spent in national rebellion, idol worship, and hardness of heart toward their covenant God before he boots them out of the land. That's a long time. With prophets declaring, obey him out of love for him under the covenant. And here's another thought. The northern kingdom of Israel was judged in 722 B.C. Man, that should have been, that that was over a hundred years before Judah got their judgment. They should have taken that to heart, right? Did you learn anything from what happened to my fulfilling my word with the northern kingdom of Israel? No, not really. God never did that to us, but they got what they deserved. It should have been a wake-up call. And it's all according to his sovereign good pleasure. As they have pressed through the centuries as a nation hardened of heart, you need to understand that's part of the plan. Now, this is bigger than us. And back in Deuteronomy chapter 29, Moses tells them, you're in the situation you're in, Israel, and you're going to be in the situation like this later because God has not given you a heart to understand or know him. Man, if you know that's true, that the only way to please him is to, is to get that heart from him, if God's at work, you'll run to him to get it. Lord, save me, help me, give, change my heart. Give me a new heart. Give me life with you, right? You can't do that. He can do that for you. He could do it for them. He is going to do it for them down the road, right? It's all part of the plan to exalt Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. God is very patient with us, but he will fulfill his word in our lives. And with respect to those who are religious hypocrites, his patience does have a limit, Oh, the horror of taking your last breath and not knowing Jesus, but thinking you do. Oh. Two, through history, God deals with nations and individuals, okay? Here's my point here. Um, with respect to <clears throat> nations and individuals, let's, let's just talk about churches and individuals, okay? With, in our day and age, we see... Uh, in the church age, God deals with churches, local bodies of believers. Now, just follow me with this a little bit. We see this in Christ's letters to the churches in Revelation. This is a corporate idea, people, for us to keep in mind at Southside. Okay? Churches are made up of individuals, but in a very real sense, we're going to stand or fall together as a church. The Ephesian church was commended for many things, <clears throat> But they were drifting from the most important thing as a church, and that was their first love, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Not all were guilty of this, but the church in general was. So as a result, there's a warning to the church. Therefore, Jesus says, remember from where you have fallen, church, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand, remove your church, unless you repent. So, I think we must all be committed to what is most important as a corporate body, or risk the removal of our church as an effective witness to the beauty of Christ and the gospel. Can that happen? Yes, it happens all the time in churches. So, let's keep that in mind. It has to do with our body and our witness, loving him supremely. As his children, may we be quick to respond to the Spirit's loving, number three, discipline in our lives. I mean, you know what? If, being quick to respond, to learn the lessons by his grace that he's teaching us as he disciplines us, which isn't fun, by the way, but then yielding the peaceful fruit of righteousness, holiness, sharing his holiness. That's wonderful joy. And that's important not only, as we said, for our individual souls, but for the sake of our witness as a church in a dark and dying land that we're in together. Okay, and here's final fourth thought. In the end, <laughs> in the end, 
God will vindicate the holiness of his great name with respect to Israel and the Gentile nations at the second coming of his son, the Messiah. Israel is going to be redeemed and restored, not only because God loves them in Abraham, but for the sake of his name. And you can see that in Romans eleven twenty five 25 through 29, that apostate people are still beloved by God for the sake of the fathers. That's the promise made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And in Ezekiel 36, he talks about their restoration and redemption. Why? He says, I'm going to do this not for your sake, Israel, but I'm going to do it for the holiness of my great name, which you profaned among the nations. I'm going to redeem and restore you because it's about me. My reputation's on the line. Isn't that wonderful? That's why he's going to make you holy. The obedience of faith is part of a Christian's life. Why? For the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. It's great stuff. Here we go. We'll finish up quickly. We better, or I'm going to be in trouble. Anyway, we come to the verses 3 through 7 then, and, and here's Nebuchadnezzar's attempt to reprogram Daniel and his friends. I think you're going to get this this is pretty amazing to me. Uh, Tanner sense, sets the uh, stage, and, and you can kind of read through this, but one of the things, uh, uh, first of all, the, the journey, and can you put slide one up for us? Hey, I have a, look at me, technical wizard. Thank you, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> you can see the fertile crescent, and on the one side in the brown is where Jerusalem is, and then up around and over to the other side, you see the Babylonian Empire, right? So they're, now here's the, point, here's the point. These young guys are taken into captivity, and, and that journey to get to Babylon is like 680 miles going up and coming down, 680 miles, uh, taking that path. And here's what he says. I like this. As they neared the end of their long and arduous journey, the glorious specter of the ancient city of Babylon began to appear on the horizon. Babylon was a city larger, more fortified, and more ornate than anything the Hebrew youths had ever seen. Through the city ran the mighty Euphrates River, the lifeline of Mesopotamia. As they drew closer, there was a large bridge for them to cross before entering one of the many glorious gates like the Ishtar Gate of the city. Just imagine how intimidating the scene must have been for these Hebrew youths. Now, next slide. I mean, I've got some pictures. Here we go. Babylon, you see, the, you see the Euphrates River running through it? Huge city. Keep going. Next one. Look at that. High, forbo foreboding walls. It's a fortress. There's the Euphrates River. You can see their ziggurat, their temple to God Marduk in the background. Next one. There it is again. That gate, that gate, that beautiful gate. They, they may have marched the, uh, Daniel and his, his companions through it, and there's that temple of Marduk again. Again, next one. There you go. Same thing. Just another angle. It just gives you the scope and the breadth. We're talking a lot of people. Behind big, high walls. Protect them. Next. There's the main thoroughfare that goes down through one of those gates. That may be where they were taken. Next. Same thing. Next. Again, there's kind of a picture. Um, this, is, this is the god Marduk. He's kind of a cross between what the king looks like. He had a serpent buddy with him, and he had wings, and it was really weird. Next. There he is again. There's that little serpent dude down below. It's associated with Marduk. Next. There's that serpent again. Next. Is that it? That's it. Amen. Just to give you an idea of what they're walking into. And he says that, you know, as they're brought in as captives, people are mocking, jeering, saying things like, this is just speculation. Foolish Hebrews, now you'll learn to trust Marduk, our great God who defeated your God. From this point on, Daniel's life would never be the same. Leaving behind everything he knew and loved, Jerusalem, the temple, all those wonderful things, never see him again. For the rest of his life, he's going to be a resident of Babylon, probably 
only a young man of 15 years at this time, now faced with the dawning challenge of remaining faithful to the true God of the Bible while living in the midst of an idolatrous and pagan civilization. And that's what we're going to enjoy seeing how that happens as we continue through Daniel. So here we go, the selection of the candidates. Kind of cool stuff. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Use, use in whom was no defect who were good-looking, showing intelligence, every branch of wisdom endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. So you can see, I had a question, what criteria was used to select who would serve the king? Well, you see it right there. The cream of the crop, right? No peasants, nobles, royal family people, no defect. That means no physical defects, you know. You know, not an ear going like this or something happening with you. Handsome, intelligent, right? Understand, discerning knowledge, ability. They have decorum. They're able to adapt to how they're supposed to act in the court, you know. So what does this tell you about Daniel's background? Was he one of the poor of the, of the land of Israel? No, because he's looking for nobility and royal family relationships. So that's where Daniel comes from. Okay, page seven. Here's a couple questions for you. Why do you think the king, king chose foreigners to help administer his kingdom? Why did he even want any Jews involved at all or other nationalities in administrating the kingdom? Does that make sense to you? Okay. Okay, so if you're going to rule somebody to have people on your staff that know that culture and can interact with them intelligently might help right? It's kind of like what we do when we send out our ambassadors, you know. They don't just pick anybody. They pick people who can identify, who can relate to that culture, who can represent us. I think that's fair. Why do you think he chose youths? Young guys, why? Yeah, so you can mold them, right? It, look at the Hitler youth. If you want to get somebody in line with your perspective, you start early. What's happening in our land with our kids? Right from the beginning, we're going to teach them how to be perverted, sexually perverted, and ignore the truth of the Bible because that hinders our objective to conform them to what we want to do with them. So taking youth was important. You can mold them. You can, conf you can get at them early on. So Tanner explains these things we just talked about. Let's go to our note then. God in his sovereignty and for the accomplishment of his divine purpose was responsible for Daniel and his companions meeting the king's requirements for entering the training program and ultimately the king's service. Nothing is happening by chance. God will use them to exalt his great name in, pagan, in the pagan kingdom of Babylon. Now, curriculum and reg regimen, okay? That's four and five. He ordered him, Aspenaz, to teach them literature, language of the Chaldeans, a daily ration. They're supposed to live on a daily ration from the king's choice food, wine, right? And three years education. okay. So the curriculum was the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Go to the next page, page 8. We're getting there, folks. Give me a few more minutes. I think this is critical, this next comment by Tanner, top of page 8. It's important to grasp that Daniel and his companions were going to be immersed, what they're going to be immersed in for three years. Tanner states, while much of this literature would have been of a historical 
and legal nature, an extensive amount would have been religious, including omen texts, magic, sorcery, occult practices, and the science of astrology. This curriculum now would have been a great challenge to their faith, don't you think? When you immerse somebody in something, it impacts you. So it would have been a great challenge to their faith, right? And we're going to see how they respond next lesson. It would have been a challenge to remain, being, remaining faithful. And, and get this, the Mosaic law prohibited the practice of such pagan, occult, religious beliefs. But not necessarily the study and understanding of such practices, okay? Only their relationship with their God could protect them in such a dark environment. So understanding it without buying into it is not, the law doesn't forbid that in and of itself, okay? The regime, regimen was food. I mean, they're going to eat like kings and drink like kings. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to do that in our culture? Sign me up for that one, boy. Barbecues with the king, hamburgers, hot dogs, steaks. What a great thing. Final thing they do is change their names. Okay. Now, you have a chart there. Hebrew name, new name. Daniel, God is my job, judge, Belshazzar meaning uncertain, but possibly protect his life, implying may Bel protect his life. Hananiah, Yahweh has been gracious. Shadrach, uncertain, but Archer suggests the meaning, the command of Aku, a Sumerian or Elamite moon god. Mishael, who is what God is? Meshach, uncertain, but Archer suggests the meaning who is what Aku is. They changed his name. See, we're going to not focus on your God, our gods. Azariah, Yahweh has helped. Abednego, possibly servant of the God Nebo. Why did they change their names? I think you mentioned, somebody mentioned, what does that do to you when you get this name instead of your name? What are they trying to do? Mold them, immerse them, change their perspective in every way possible. They're trying to do that to them. Page nine, last page. Okay. So that's the overall goal of this selection and training process. The new names were the final attack on their heritage and faith, Tanner says degrading them, showing that they're under their authority. So some final thoughts. Now, and so you can think with this, uh, through me with this fairly quickly. I think the point is pretty obvious. As we reflect on this section uh, and training process, what kinds of observations can we make, especially as we compare the values of Babylon with God's values and standards? Right? Uh, what I want you to see is that on one side, you have the world system orchestrated by Satan. What's the focus? What's the focus? What is valued? Looks, intelligence, nobility, all the things that we value. Look at our movie stars. Look at all the people with the money. Wow, I want, oh, I want to be like that. That's what I need, an elitist attitude, right? They're beneath me. If I have that status, they're beneath me. Be the best you can be. You know, climb the ladder. Improve your looks. Improve your intelligence. Improve everything you need to improve to make it in this society and have good stuff. They pick those kind of people. And, and ultimately, it's a worldly, ungodly lifestyle, isn't it? We're going to see the contrast. Worldly, ungodly lifestyle that permeated their society, that permeates our society. 
the world always operates on a different value system than God's, and you can see it in how they chose these men and trained them. Right? It's horrible, in a sense. What about the little guys that have problems learning? Oh, you're beneath me. What do kids do in school with the kids that have less ability or have, you know, they bully them. They make fun of them. That's just the way the world is. That's satanic. It's not the way the Bible talks about. Final point there. The world's value system will always be opposed to God. Satan will never stop trying to impose his perverted, godless values upon those seeking to live for the glory of God, reflecting the beauty of Christ to a world enslaved to darkness and sin, right? We're in that battle right now today. Your kids are in this battle right now today. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God alone, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. What's Satan trying to do? Conform you to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind through this book so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And then Peter says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour today here in this room. But resist him. How? Firm in your faith, clinging to the God you know is truly God and his promises. Okay. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world, Daniel is part of the great cloud of witnesses that will condemn you if you punt the faith. How did he make it? He accomplished it by the grace and power of God, by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great book, this magnificent gem in the middle of the Old Testament that talks to us about your person and power and plan and purpose to exalt Jesus Christ as the King of Israel and the nations for all eternity, the Son of David, in fulfilling your word. Thank you that your faithful God who won't let your children press on in sin in any way. For the sake of your name, you deal with us as a loving parent so we can share your holiness and have the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And oh God, may we never buy into the lies of the enemy about what's important and what we should value. As we look at this book, we're going to see the great contrast in these two worldviews. Help us to revel in knowing and loving, fearing, obeying you. For the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen.